Hey guys, uh, I just wanted to kind of throw up a little video to talk a little bit more, I guess, candidly about the first, uh, the first three Bond movies. Um, you know, I, I've never actually done scripted reviews before, uh, before the Dr. No review. Um, I had, I, I had a, a thing set up called, uh, called R rated, uh, slash R rated the morning out. There were like three different names for it, but the idea was, you know, go to a movie and the next morning get up and kind of do a do a thing uh do a review and i did that for a couple movies i did it for guardians of the galaxy i did it for uh the angry video game nerd movie uh and i was planning on doing one for the avengers but i think i i'm gonna wait on that to do uh an, an avengers 2 ant-man uh thing together in a couple weeks but i just figured it'd be kind of nice to talk a little bit more openly because uh, not everything quite makes it onto the page or onto the screen when you do scripted stuff, as I've come to come to find out. Uh, speaking of seriously, uh, this is probably going up as I'm working on Thunderball. I just came out of the shower uh, for reasons that you'll see when that video goes up. Uh, I know that it's taking forever. Uh, there were a, a couple things going on that were kind of out of my hands, and a few that were that were my fault for for this taking so long. Uh, I got a bit of. Uh, writer's block while working on it um the pace is a little strenuous i'm technically trying to catch up i'm behind by a little bit but hopefully uh as some of these reviews start to become just about the one movie and not about oh here's dr no but also casino royale here's goldfinger but also the man from uncle um i, I think uh thunderball kind of has some info you only live twice we've already watched uh and there's a little bit of, there's another thing going on there, but I think uh, for On Her Majesty's Secret Service, uh, I think that's going to be the first one that has, like, just the movie and nothing else. Um, maybe a little bit of backdrop uh, for uh, George Lazenby, but other than that, it's going to be basically just the movie, so hopefully it'll be easier. Uh, I keep trying to make them shorter, and they just get longer. I think Thunderball is probably going to be about the same length as Goldfinger, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um... But seriously, it's been a lot of fun so far. Uh, I've been getting a lot of really positive response from it. It's really cool that you guys are into Seriously, at least, you know, on the same level that I am. Uh, the rest of the D-pad team has been kind of incrementally doing stuff here and there for it. Uh, the, the first really big thing is coming with Thunderball in, in two ways. And, and you know, uh, you'll see that as, as that video goes up. Um, and I'm actually really interested, excited, and scared for the non-Sean Connery Bond movies that are coming up because uh, the first three were very good. Uh, the ones that came after were not as good as the first three. Uh, and anything between Honor Majesty's Secret Service and uh, Die Another Day, I haven't seen at all. Well, I, I, mean, I might have seen little bits and pieces. I, I'm familiar with Goldeneye. I think all of us are. Uh, and other than that, though, I haven't seen anything else, so I have no idea what's, what's on its way, uh, but I suspect they're not all gold, um, and I, and I imagine the reason that there's, you know, a debate about which Bond is the best Bond probably has something to do with the fact that, uh, you know, with Sean Connery, he's usually a pretty, a pretty standard best, so that, that, that leaves me a little worried about where the other... The other five, or four, I guess. I'm actually a big fan of Daniel Craig's Bond movies, so I'm less worried about those. I've seen all three of those. Uh, but the remaining... Oh, gee, what what would that be? The remaining 16, 15 that are left have me a little worried, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, let's... I, I should probably stop rambling and, uh, and jump into the first movie uh, that we've done, Dr. No. So, Dr. No was... A bit of an experience. Uh, I have never seen anything Dr. No before. I knew not a single fucking thing. Um, I think everyone who knows just a little bit about Bond uh, from the 60s probably knows about Goldfinger and not much else. Uh, just because uh, out of the five movies that I've watched so far, Goldfinger is the only one that actually seemed kind of recognizable, at least culturally. So Dr. No was, was a bit of an experience. Um, it starts, it actually, the pacing, you know, when I watched it at first, I thought it was kind of slow, but, you know, watching it a couple times to, to get the review ready and 
especially in comparison to the ones that I've seen since, the pacing's actually pretty okay. It's kind of in the middle. Um, there's definitely a little bit of slowness, but uh, there's some really, you know, the pacing picks up in a couple spots, and like the fight scenes, uh, there aren't a ton of fight scenes, but the ones that there are are actually surprisingly on point. Uh, like one of the first things that happens in the movie after Bond gets to Jamaica is he gets picked up by the fake driver, figures it out, gets away from the from the other, you know, Spectre goon that's following him, and then pulls the guy out and just just punches him out, just cold cocks him right there. Uh, and it took me a little by surprise, because, I mean, I've watched movies from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s before, and they're usually really stagey. Like, someone will go for a punch, and it will be, like, all the way out here, and you'll see, ah, oh, but... Something about the perspective they use, something about the way they frame the shot, and they probably come pretty damn close, because uh, it, it looks, even when you slow it down and look frame by frame, it's actually a pretty convincing hit. Uh, the, the villain, Dr. No, is kind of unimposing. It's actually sort of weird, like it makes total sense after the fact with how Bond villains kind of feel, because they're always a little over the top. But it's it's a it's a radio it's a radiation specialist who's using radios or radio waves or radio. I wasn't entirely sure how he was doing what he was doing, but he was basically knocking over rockets. Uh, that's a pretty normal, boringish sort of thing to do. Um, and if it weren't for his sort of just stone-faced demeanor and slow speech, very articulate and the kind of Nehru jacket thing going on. If it wasn't for that, and obviously the metal hands, then he would be a totally, like, he would be a villain from any action movie at that point. Uh, so, you know, Dr. No w was not a terribly imposing guy. I think the reason that he's so iconic today is just because he was the first villain, because, you know, of, of the, you know, eight movies that I've seen uh, in the Bond franchise, Dr. No doesn't really stand out as a character all that much. Uh, but I, I can understand why pop culture really loves him. Uh, he's He makes an appearance really quickly in uh, the Heineken ad for either Quantum of Solace or Skyfall, I forget which, but uh, there there's you know there's actually a really great song called uh, Man Like That. I, I, I forget who sings it, but uh, she does a really good job with it, and that's the song from the commercial, and it's a really upbeat thing that I've gotten into just from doing research on Bond stuff. Uh, but Dr. No shows up in the commercial uh, because some guy's offering him beer and says, Doctor, and they use stock footage of him, and he says, No. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, the lair is pretty cool. It Again, nowadays, and even especially compared to other Bond villains, uh, it's nothing that elaborate, uh, but it looks cool. And for the time in the 60s, that was a pretty slamming base. Like, uh, you think of a bad guy, they're usually working in a warehouse, or they got, like, you know, a back alley, or, or, you know, their house, their nice mansion kind of thing. This is, like, this is quirky and weird. There's a magnifying, there's a giant magnifying wall so the fish look huge. Uh, he's got that stolen painting, which I could not possibly remember the name to without a script in front of me. Uh, um... And he's just got this elaborate setup. And it's it's kind of funny, too, uh, to see where, like, Austin Powers borrows from it. Because they're looking at the magnified fish, and he just says, one million dollars. And you're like, huh, what? And, and he explains that it costs one million dollars to build the that, like, the base, basically. And it's like, okay. And you have to remember that at the time, a million dollars, which was the budget for the movie, was, I, I want to say it was, like, nah, like eight or nine million dollars today. Uh, which isn't a small amount of money, but you think about extravagant Bond villain bases, that's probably not going to be the size or the, the cost that comes to mind, uh, especially when you start comparing it to the later Bond villains. Like, uh, I, I, what was it, Goldfinger had something like $20 billion, or 20, uh, 20 million pounds in gold bullion that he, was, was, that he owned, I think, and he was going to steal 100 million pounds uh, or $100 million of, of gold from Fort Knox. So, like, the comparison, after the fact, Dr. No feels kind of small potatoes. I'm wondering if that's kind of why they set up Goldfinger and Dr. No together in Goldeneye Rogue Agent. It, it might be. Um, 
but I'm getting a little off track. The location, Jamaica, was pretty cool. Quarrel is just the fucking coolest. Uh, I, I, I was really bored by him when he first showed up because it's like, okay, it's just some Jamaican guy. Uh, and admittedly, while watching it, it seemed a little insensitive, and I was just like, oof, okay, 1962, a little bit rough, but all right. But, you know, in reading, you know, the popular opinion at the time, people actually loved Coral back then, too, and, and he was, I guess, a prominent sort of, he was considered to be, like, a really awesome character in, in you know, the sort of social scene of the time, just because he was you know, an active part of the plot. He knew stuff that Bond needed in order to get through. He actually fought against Dr. No's men, and he died fighting the dragon, which uh, I actually did straight up go, no, while watching the movie when that happened, because I was kind of hoping Quarrel would live, and it seems sort of naive now. I mean, like, nobody in Bond movies lives except for Bond, and usually, but not always, the Bond girl. Um, but... I, it, I had to watch the scene with the photographer like eight times because it just didn't register to me because she, she leans over and she just she breaks like a bulb for her camera, I guess, against the table. And then you see her go huh, with a broken bulb. So just glass to the face, slash, and he just kind of goes, oh, it's blood. And he turns to Bond and is like, She's probably not going to cooperate. You want me to break her arm? And it's like, whoa! I, it took me aback, really. It's, it was fucking impressive, man. Uh, Quarrel is badass. Um, so far, probably my favorite... I, I, I'll, you know, I'll take it back. Kareem Bay is actually a pretty awesome sidekick, too. But uh, Quarrel is definitely up there. Um, he's an awesome fucking sidekick. It was, it was really cool. Um... The, the Bond chick, Ursula Andress, uh, as, as Honey Rider, I, whatever, you know, I, I was kind of unimpressed, and it wasn't her, it wasn't her fault, uh, it was definitely the writing, she just sort of, she shows up as a bystander, gets kind of wrapped into it, contributes nothing to the actual plot, and gets saved from a room that is filling with water, uh, and that's the end, like, that's, that's her arc right there. Uh, apparently, I, I, I haven't read the Bond books, unfortunately, but apparently in the original draft, they were going to have crabs, you know, crawling all over her and she was going to scream because, ah, crabs. Uh, but apparently, uh, two things happened. One, Ursula Andress was actually very familiar with crabs and knew that they were mostly harmless if she didn't like cause any trouble. Uh, and two, the crabs themselves were really just sort of sedate. Like, they were just kind of hanging out. Even aside from her being chill about it, they were just kind of like, whatever, whatever. We're just going to hang out today. Uh, plus, I I just, I, I do wish that the scene happened in full because I can't imagine something more amazing than watching Ursula Andress covered in crabs. Just like, ah. It, <laughs> that would have actually amped up the silliness to a point that probably would have fit for a, for a Bond movie, to be totally honest. Um... Because otherwise, the plot is sort of slightly quirky spy film, which maybe that's the safer way to go. I mean, they did the same thing with Doctor Who. The entire first season of, of the new Doctor Who in 2005 was either set on Earth or spaceships and nowhere else. They never set foot on an alien planet. Uh, and I feel like that was a deliberate move to make sure that, you know, they could cultivate a new fan base, not throw everything at them at once, just kind of get them used to it little by little. And then, you know, season two, first thing they do is they go to New New York. So... Uh, I'm getting off track. I'm making all these comparisons. Uh, Felix Leiter, kind of boring. Jack Lord was, was, in, well, he was fine. He wasn't in it much. He was very white bread. Uh, uh, and it didn't, it didn't leave an impression on me. I can understand why he wanted a bigger role, uh, for Goldfinger. Um, still doesn't quite excuse. You gotta, I mean... You kind of got to play ball in Hollywood. You can't go making demands about stuff if you're number two, you know? Uh, I, I think I highlighted that in, in the Goldfinger review, and I used, I used uh, uh, Terrence Howard as my example, as my comparison for that, and even that wasn't entirely fair. Apparently what happened there was 
Uh, they were going to offer him $8 million to be an Iron Man 2, and then they offered him $1 million and had given the other $7 million to Robert Downey Jr. And the reason there was they were like, hey, you know, we can make this movie without you. So, which, I mean, yeah, they, they could have. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. was definitely kicking some serious ass in the Tony Stark role. So, I mean, yeah. But, so he said no. In steps Don Cheadle, who is plenty satisfied with getting $1 million to, to play the role. And now he's in Iron Man 3 and the Avengers 2 and all this other... He's going to be in Civil War. I think we know who won in that case, you know? You gotta... you gotta. So Jack Lord, I get it, but, you know, literally, like, aside from, aside from the guys playing Bond and Lighter, almost every other recurring character is played by one person for, like, 90% of the original Bond run. Uh, Bernard Lee plays M for... God, I think seven or eight movies. Um, I forget the name of the woman who plays Money Penny. She's in there for like ten or twelve. Desmond Llewellyn plays Q for like sixteen movies or something freaking insane. Um, and he was totally prepared to play more. I, I, I he died, which was the ultimate reason that they pulled him out. And I want to say it was the same for for Bernard Lee and for um, God. Why well, can't I remember her name? Shit. I want to say it's like Lori or something for, for Money Penny, but uh, I digress. Uh, it, it's, it seems kind of weird that they kept changing out lighter. Like maybe that was kind of the point after a while. Um, I know they do the same thing with Blofeld uh, after, after he shows up in You Only Live Twice. So, I mean, I guess that's just a thing that they do. Uh, all in all, Dr. No, I really liked. Uh, it, was, it was a really solid start. Uh, better than a lot of the stuff I've seen out of the 60s. Uh, and, I mean, it's kind of impressive. The, the budget was decent, but it was certainly not great. Uh, Sean Con Of the $1 million budget that that movie had, Sean Connery, I, I think, got 100000 So he got just shy of a million dollars to appear in it, which is still great. Uh, but... Right away, there's 10%, so you're left with 900k uh, to make a movie with uh, in on location too. Like they filmed a lot of that in Jamaica, so it was really impressive. Uh, it was good stuff. Uh, it really made me want to drink some Red Stripe. <laughs> um, uh, Bond drinking that fucking coffee. Just, I got really annoyed with with Bond for that one moment because he was very perceptive for the rest of the movie, but he just, oh, I've been captured. Better drink this liquid that they've left in my room. And then it didn't really mean anything, so I, I didn't really get the point of that. But uh, Dr. No was a solid start, uh, and it actually did get me very excited for From Russia With Love. So From Russia With Love, uh, number two of the Bond movies, uh, I was all jazzed up to see it. Uh, and the so uh, I, I realized just after we put up the Dr. No review that... Um, the day that From Rush With Love was supposed to go up. So I'll, I'll own up to this. We have been late the entire time. I'm working on it, I promise. Uh, but From Rush With Love was supposed to go up uh, the day that... The, the day of Sarah Sarah's and my uh, second anniversary. And I thought like, oh man. So between that and the title itself being From Rush With Love and incidentally a movie that features... Uh, at least some level of actual romance between Bond and um, uh, Tanya or, or Tatiana Romanova. Uh, it, it all sort of fit together in a nice way, and I thought, oh, they'd make a nice sort of theme to go with it. Um, she was really excited about it too, and yes, she had wanted to watch Doctor No with me, but uh, she was busy for most of the week leading up, and I needed, and I knew that I needed to watch it early in the week if I wanted any chance of getting getting it done in time for. Uh, that Friday, and then it wasn't. I think it went up on, on like, Saturday or Sunday. Um, so I was bummed, and I was like, hey, well, we'll do this, and we'll, we'll make it work. Uh, I, I feel like I kind of rushed the writing on that one a little bit. There were a lot of jokes where, after the fact, I was like, ah, if I just, if I thought about it a little harder, it would have been, it would have been good, uh, or it would have been better, I guess. Um, I felt like I didn't give, like, I, 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 I've got a pretty good idea of, you know, 
the the character I guess that I have in a lot of the D pad stuff. It's not it, like I'm not putting on a show. I, I don't want people to think that I'm you know making shit up or I'm trying to be a different person, but. There are definitely certain qualities of myself that I kind of exaggerate a little bit, or or ones that I that I bring to the front of the of the page for uh, for the videos that we do. Uh, but I, I I felt like I I know sort of what I what I present myself as on camera and how I want to look and how I want to act and stuff. But I hadn't really put enough thought into how I was going to do the same with Sarah uh, and. We are planning on having other folks show up in videos. Um, we already had uh, Ben as the It's Man from Monty Python's Flying Circus for Goldfinger, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, I, I feel like I didn't give her enough characterization. If she's in for another review, I'm sure we'll we'll fix that and we'll make it a little bit better. Uh, the story totally confused me the first time around, if I'm really honest. Uh, I was... Lost, 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 lost uh, for the first uh, viewing. And it wasn't until watching it two, three times where I kind of realized I think that was the point. Like, you're sub like Bond is your audience surrogate, at least in that movie. He's not always, because uh, a lot of times they'll give you sort of, oh, here's what the bad guy's doing. And it, to, be, to be honest, I really don't like that in movies. I feel like it's kind of cheap. I feel like it ruins surprises, and I feel like it, it doesn't give the protagonist enough credit and it doesn't give the audience enough credit uh and it, it kind of feels like a shortcut it's like oh shit how am i gonna figure out how to let the audience know that the orcs are arming themselves for war uh fuck i have no idea quick let's get a camera shot of all the art uh, of all the orcs arming for war like it it you know it doesn't feel right it, it can be done well there are times it can be done well uh but it gets confusing sometimes, and From Rush With Love sort of did that in spots. Not not the, hey, here's the bad guy, but uh, in the sort of like, uh, you know, it's not bad, actually. And I, I'm, I'm getting myself all confused just thinking about other movies. It's bad in a lot of the movies that I see it in. From Rush With Love avoids it entirely, or almost entirely. I think the only times you see the bad guys are at the very beginning and the very end, when they meet with Blofeld, numbers three and nine, uh, three and five, sorry. Uh, at the very beginning and the very end, and when Rosa Klebb is getting um, is getting Red Grant really early in the movie. Uh, the rest of the time, I I think we're with Bond the entire rest of the way. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of awesome to be able to watch a movie where you follow the same train of thought. Uh, the only thing that you really know going in is that Red Grant is uh, is basically the bad guy for most of the movie. And that Romanova is not exactly what she says she is. But ultimately, the twist is that she is what she says she is. She falls in love with Bond, so... Uh, but I liked it. It made it a little bit more organic, I think. It made it a little bit easier to... It, it didn't make it easier to follow. It made it easier to follow with Bond, I, I think. Um, and as all the pieces start to come into place, you sort of go like, Oh, shit, okay, I'm seeing how all this is coming together. Um, now, the plot was very slow to get moving, uh, but it felt deliberate in a good way, and Goldfinger was very much the same. Uh, it, it had a couple bumps and bruises along the way, but it, it kind of built this tension because you sort of feel Red Grant stalking Bond for like most of the movie, and it just seems like he's getting closer and closer and closer, and then suddenly, boom, he's in, and he's pretending to be this other guy, uh, and it's just like, oh shit, at any second he could just off him right there. Uh, and that actually factors really well into the characterization of Red Grant because that was sort of what he was supposed to do. He wasn't meant to, like, toy with him. He was meant to kill him and retrieve the, the, the uh, Lecter device. Uh, also, it was called the Spectre device in the, in the, uh, the books, but they hadn't invented Spectre yet. Uh, that is what Thunderball is going to be all about in a lot of ways. Spectre is... A big mess. It, you'll, you'll see when we get there. Uh, as far as the characters went, uh, Romanova was a huge, huge step up from Ursula Andress. Uh, she was actually functional. She actually had shit to do. Um, she wasn't, you know, necessarily pivotal to the plot, but she actually, she sort of was the plot in a lot of ways. The goal was to sort of retrieve her and the Lecter device. So it, 
It was more than just, oh, here's some woman who's here as eye candy, and oh, she's gone now. Oh, rescue her. Okay, you did. The movie's over. So, so Romanova was a pretty nice touch. Um, Kareem Bay, also awesome. Uh, I would say he's not quite the level of Quarrel, but he was way more entertaining. He was a lot more fun. He was definitely the kind of guy that you want to go and get a drink with. Uh, and that was really cool. I, I was a big fan of that. Uh, Red Grant. Damn. He was, he was surprisingly effective as a bad guy. He was just sort of, the, the best comparison I, 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 that I think I can think of is uh, the original Legend of Zelda. Uh, there's sort of, especially once you're familiar with the plot of the game, there's just sort of a presence of Ganon everywhere. Everything's kind of empty, and you know the bad guy is just, basically like just off screen. That's kind of what Red Grant is in this movie. He's just sort of this force that's there, but Bond can't quite see him. He's just out of range. He's just out of his peripheral vision. So it's cool to watch him sort of hunt his prey a little bit. Um, his voice was kind of silly. Uh, I did not realize that it was Robert Shaw uh, at first. I definitely saw something familiar. I actually, he looks so much like Daniel Craig. I didn't use the best comparison shot for it because they don't hold on, Daniel's, on Daniel Craig's face often enough, uh, in, um, Quantum of Solace? No, in Casino Royale. I forget which one he actually breaks into M's house. The one that I used in that movie. Uh, but, I think it was, I think it was Casino Royale. Uh, but, it, it kind of occurred to me, and honestly, it was actually an accident. I had made a bunch of Jaws references way before that, and was gonna tie it together with, at the end. Uh, and then I learned that that was, Quint from Jaws, and I was like, oh, shit, well, yeah, this is, let's do this now, uh, and, and also didn't realize that it was the 40th anniversary of the, of the release of Jaws that weekend as I was releasing it, so it was all this stuff that came together really cool. His voice was not terribly, uh, intimidating, but his little speech about how he was basically going to torture Bond was very intimidating, uh, it, it definitely gave me chills watching it, um, However, that hubris just totally bit him in the ass. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely sort of the gold standard of, hey, I've got you right where I want you. Now I'm going to talk so much that you can figure out a way out. Uh, so it, it sort of, um, oh, Jesus, Xbox, stop listening. Stop listening. There we go. I got the, the Xbox is on in the back. We've, we were watching Food Fight before, uh, before I recorded this. Um, Red Grant is, is just damn solid. Uh, there's a pretty clear XP of him in You Only Live Twice, which we're, we'll get to. Uh, but he was damn good. That fight scene was actually pretty intense. I wasn't expecting a full-on fight scene that was going to be that hardcore and the fucking choking him out. And, uh, it, it was, it was real good. Uh, the Krilenko thing was a little bit skimmed over. It took me a while to realize that it was all the same guy, the basically um, Kareem Bay's rival, because uh, he's in the he's in the meeting near the beginning with the uh, with the Soviets, and he's the guy who attacks the the um, the gypsy camp, and then he's the one crawling out of uh, the woman's mouth for the uh, Call Me Buana poster, which uh, I thought that was also kind of a neat nod from Saltzman and Broccoli to themselves to put up like basically a billboard for their own movie in their own movie. That was, that was a nice touch. Um, but Rosa Klebb and, uh, Oh, I forgot number five's name. Shit. Damn it. I forget. Ah, crap. I've been doing so good. I'm usually not this good with remembering character names, but alas, he was the, he was the, he was the chess master. He was pretty cool. I, I, I get why Blofeld killed him, but it was such a bummer to watch a character that was that competent get offed that unceremoniously. Uh, and Rosa Klebb, I just burst out laughing twice in a row, her in the maid outfit. That reaction was genuine. Because uh, I was watching it, it didn't strike me at first, it was sort of like a... W wait a minute. Is that... And it... The, the second I realized it just, I was done with it. And then the fucking knife shoe. 
how could a knife shoe, like I get that your legs, you have more reach on your legs than with your hand, generally speaking. Fair enough. But, I feel like it would take nothing to step on the blade and therefore break it, for one. Uh, and you're a lot less limber with your legs than you are with your hands. Your hands are a lot more ambulatory. You can move them around and kind of navigate. There's a reason most people don't stab people with their feet, you know? Uh, so it was kind of, it was kind of strange. Uh, I laughed my ass off at that scene too because it seemed like it was sped up just a teeny tiny bit. Uh, so there, just a lot about that was weird. And then the really awkward throwing of the film and then the, the wave is just like, what happened? The movie was great for the first 90%. And then there's a helicopter fight that doesn't have a lot of basis. Like it's, it's Red Grant's escape team. So he beats up the guy in the car. He blows up the helicopter. He steals the boat. He blows up people with the boat in what, honest to God, looked like a fucking, like what you'd see if you went to Universal Studios. You're just like, ah, oh, and, and everything. And the wall of fire. Um, but all in all, it was, it was very good. I actually liked it better than Dr. No. Uh, it felt fuller. It felt more like a Bond movie, more like a spy movie too. Cause there was a lot of like, um, anti espionage, espionage going on and, and stuff like that. And it felt like it was bigger than just one location. Um, uh, I was a little confused that the whole plot was on the one hand, it seems at first like the plot is that uh, Spectre wants the Lecter device, which they do, but I feel like the the drive is more just to kill Bond. Like, he took out Dr. No, so therefore he must die, kind of thing, you know? Um, it's just It was just a little bit tricky, but uh, it, it was, all in all, a good movie. I liked it a lot, and again, it got me really excited for the next one. So, I guess let's talk about Goldfinger. Goldfinger was perfect. It, 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 or about as close to perfect as I, as I could have possibly imagined. Uh, everything about it was just really nicely laid into place. Uh, there's a lot of spots where the movie kind of tricks you. Uh, and it just, all in all, everything about it seemed great. Um, the, the little intro battle seemed a little weird. Uh, I wasn't really expecting that. And I've noticed in watching more movies uh, that I should start to get accustomed to it. Uh, but the, the opening, the opening was very strange. It was a little bit raw -er of a fight, a bit more Daniel Craigie, if I, if I may. Uh, I, I loved the, uh, the heroin flavored bananas. It was a good touch. Uh, it was just, it, it was interesting to watch Bond immediately go into super spy mode, like secret agent, super spy, like archer level mode right off the bat. So that was cool. Uh, Goldfinger was, uh, Totally not imposing for the first two thirds of the movie. Uh, I guess actually that's not even true because the laser scenes like halfway through. So for the first half of the movie, very not imposing. He seems sort of oafish, just a big, fat, dumb guy who really likes yellow, uh, who likes cheating dudes at cards despite having millions of dollars to his name. Um, but as the movie goes on, and especially once. Bond is captured and he's on the table. It's just like, wow, okay, Goldfinger is actually stepping it up a notch. And the twist, when Bond figures out what is actually going on, that it's not about stealing the gold, it's about irradiating the gold. Bond's reaction was pretty much my reaction. Just that sort of like, oh, shit. Oh, my God, that is actually brilliant. Like, why would you need to steal it if you could ruin it and thus make the, the value of gold go up by so much that his own worth would just explode. Uh, it was, and just like watching that look of victory on his face is amazing. Uh, Cause you can tell that at this point he's assumed that he's won. Likewise, Bond assumes that he ha has lost uh, pretty much from the point that he's in the table to the end of the movie. He's pretty certain that he's lost. And from that moment where he realizes what the plan is, he knows that he has lost. There is no chance of him stopping this plan. Uh, especially since Goldfinger has proven to be very good at keeping him imprisoned with the exception of the little woo trick that he does in the cell, which is then rectified by having like 50 guys hanging out in the cell with him. Um, Goldfinger, very imposing once, once the halfway point comes around. Um, Pussy Galore, uh, was sort of a weird character because she sort of marks the turn 
in the series where the Bond girls go from just being... So you got Ursula Andress, who is a just a, a bystander. You have... Um, you have Tatiana Romanova, who is part of the plot, but she doesn't really want to be, and she doesn't really understand what's going on, so she's sort of implicit in it, but she doesn't know. Uh, and then you get to Pussy Galore, who is an active part of the bad guy's team, who does turn, but she's a part of the bad guy's team, which actually gets extended over into Thunderball, where you see um, Fiona, Volpe, uh, Fiona Volpe? Volpa? I don't actually know how to pronounce I don't speak Italian. Um... But she, who, you you know, we'll talk about that in the Thunderball review, but she is the, the natural kind of extreme on the other end where she's kind of an incorruptibly bad guy. Uh, but so it's a nice progression. You get to see her pretty confidently being like, yeah, that's not going to work on me. What the hell? Uh, she feels very on the sidelines. Like she takes an active, like, plot. She actually, she takes an active part in the plot but her actions, her biggest actions take place off camera. And I, I, it, uh, I have been told, and I agree, that the, the mention of the, the weird, fucked up rape story in, in, you know, on the sidelines uh, was very jarring uh, in the review. And I agree, it was very jarring in the movie too. Uh, I... I for a while, I wasn't sure if I should mention it, but there's really no way to get around explaining how Pussy Galore actually swapped out the canisters uh, than explaining, you know, the incident that led to it. Uh, it made me very uncomfortable, I'll be honest, to, to even have to talk about it in the review. Uh, but, I don't know, the plot would seem kind of missing pieces if I didn't mention it and it would seem like I was actively avoiding it which I would have been uh man it makes a, it makes a lot of Sean Connery's advances in in the in the following movies just a little bit more uncomfortable um oh, that's it's it's really hard to get past that uh so I apologize I I I apologize if that was like super jarring and you know, if it was sort of a, a triggery thing, I guess, for, for anyone, either there or here, I, I should have kind of, you know, warned about that uh, ahead of time. Uh, but it's tough. It's tough when it's part of the plot, when it's an active, like, pivot point of the plot. So I, I don't know how I feel about it, but that's really, like, the only negative thing I can think of in the entire movie, to be totally honest. Uh, I love that Bond fucks with Goldfinger over and over. Uh, between the card game and the golf game. I love that he just kind of plop the, the gold bar onto the grass. Uh, and boy, isn't it convenient that, that Goldfinger really doesn't give a shit about getting the Nazi gold bar, which presumably would be really goddamn rare, uh, instead opting for the cash value. Which I was like, ah, that feels, that feels kind of cheap, especially since Bond ultimately wins. So it's not like he was actually going to lose it in the first place. Um... Odd job is awesome. So far, ooh boy, he's probably this It's hard to place him against Red. I think I think Grant is a better bad guy. It's a question of whether Grant qualifies as a henchman or a villain. I guess technically he is the henchman. He's the dragon if we're if we're in trope speak here. Uh, in the same way that Odd Job, I guess, is the dragon for Goldfinger. So Odd Job so far, number two dragon of the series. Uh, so that puts our, our dragons, uh, number one, Red Grant, number two, Odd Job, number three, uh, the tank. Uh, so, <laughs> God, the fucking dragon tank. Um, Goldfinger, uh, the plot was very deliberate. You followed along slowly to let it all kind of grow. Uh, I loved the Ebert explanation of why Goldfinger was, uh, explaining the the wrong plan the the theft plan to his to his guys and, and that one being that he just he had the models made and then he changed his plan but he was like oh man i had all these things made i gotta show them off i can't just let these go to waste i think that's awesome uh it doesn't quite explain why he had uh he had mr solo get crushed in the car i mean maybe it was sort of a you know you know, an insolence kind of thing, like, oh, you, you're backing out of the plan? Then you get to die much slower than everyone else. Uh, 
I understand why the, why the cube car didn't have blood in the modern day. You better believe that thing would be drenched because uh, a person barely fits into that space. And the, what, gallonish of blood that people have in their body or, li or liter, I don't know volumetric measurements at all, guys. However much blood we have in our body, that's probably going to be showing there. Uh, apparently they had to cut the cube in half, actually, because it weighed so much that it was breaking the pickup truck. That is an actual cubed car. Uh, the guy who sold them that car was actually very depressed that they were breaking a brand new car. Uh, a brand new nice car. So I'm sure when they were like, oh, we're going to cube it, he was, oh, God. Oh, wait, no, we have to cut the cube in half. Ah! So uh, the gold car thing was so fucking silly. But it felt appropriate. It it worked for Goldfinger. He, ju he seemed just weird enough for that to work um jill masterson was kind of neat for how short she was there uh i love that m seems concerned about bond's well-being it's like look if you need to take a break if this is too much for you that chick that you met two hours ago just you know take a breather we can send 008 it's totally fine um so that was weird tilly masterson is hilariously inept uh she does exactly zero things correctly she can't shoot uh she can't you know sneak around very well uh and then she gets hit by the odd job hat uh in a way that at first i honestly thought she was knocked out it took me until well into the next like 15 minutes to realize oh she's probably dead huh so jill and tilly eh the masterson sisters were okay uh, Pussy Galore is clearly the main focus of the women in the movie. Um, the gold shot, uh, Frozen Foxy pointed out that I neglected to mention that people were actually, uh, people actually thought that, uh, the, the woman whose name escapes me right now, who played Jill Masterson, it was it Shirley Eaton, I think? Uh, people thought she was dead because of the myth caused by, caused by all this, where everyone was like, oh my god, she'll suffocate with all the body paint on her. And they thought she was dead. Uh, she actually just, she became a mother. She had kids and she retired from acting because she wanted to take care of her family. So props for, for someone who went, who was, who is really probably the most iconic Bond girl as far as like imagery. You think Bond, you're probably going to think of, oh, the woman covered in gold, you know? Uh, so props to her for, for making that decision. That's a totally supportable decision. Um, and yes, it was totally true. They left some portion of her of her stomach, I think it was, or her chest, uh, uncovered in paint, just to be sure. I, I fucking love that. Like, they couldn't find any biologist to be like, hey, no, that's not how air works. Um, I also kind of got it across a little weird that you can die from it, but it is strictly a heat stroke thing. Like, your body will... because. So the idea is... If your pores are blocked, you can't sweat. And if you can't sweat, your body can't cool down. So if it starts getting hot, then your body's getting heated up and you might actually suffer from heat stroke. And if you don't, you know, get that taken care of immediately, you could actually die. Um, a very different situation, though. And it takes a while. It would take a couple hours at minimum for that to happen. Uh, and heat, if you were, you know, chilly, it probably wouldn't matter all that much. Uh, I can't imagine she, she you know... I feel like if you're covered in gold paint, your skin's going to break out like crazy. All in all, Goldfinger is, of the first three, definitely my favorite. Uh, it was just, it was really good. Oh, Desmond Llewellyn being, like, snarky Q was pretty fucking cool, too. Um, I, I can't believe I didn't mention him. He's he's awesome. He's gonna he's in, like, the next something like 12 Bond movies. or, or so. I think he had 14 appearances. They weren't entirely sequential. He missed three of them. Uh, sorry, no, he, of the next 14, he's in 11. So, he's gonna be around a lot. Uh, he was great. Um, Cease Linder as Felix Leiter was just the strangest casting. He, like, I, I know he wasn't that old, but he looked that old. He did not look even slightly like Bond's, um, age, basically. He didn't, he didn't look like someone who would have gone on missions with him. Uh, so it was a little bit jarring. I don't understand why him and, oh, I've, excuse me. Oh my God. 
I, I, for, I forget the name of the guy. Was it like Austin Willis or something like that? The, uh, the guy who was supposed to play lighter. I don't even understand how they could have swapped roles and just been, and everyone was like, okay, yeah, cool. But they did, so whatever. Um, lighter was weirdly like he kept they they kept reminding us that he was there i didn't show it in the review but about every 20 minutes or so we'd cut to him and his partner sitting at a kfc because they're in kentucky sitting at a kfc waiting for for bond's tracker and then when odd job brings mr solo out to get crushed the tracker goes there and they follow they they follow the signal there they don't run into odd job and then go straight back and it's like what what is the point of these scenes i i guess I feel like it might have been it might have been slightly to spite Jack Lord. It's possible because it's definitely slightly more presence than it was in the first movie. In Doctor No, Lighter was barely there. He was there in Jamaica uh, with Quarrel when they're doing like the discussion, but then they part ways until the very end of the movie. So uh, there's definitely more of Lighter in in Goldfinger than there is in Doctor No. Um, Sorry, I'm just checking the mic, making sure that it's still recording. Uh, so lighter, lighter was kind of strange in that regard. Uh, I love the plot at the end. I love that Goldfinger tries to hide out as one of the American soldiers, even for just a second, like they're not going to recognize him. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. The golden gun thing. I keep getting into this weird sort of synchronicity. Is that it? Synchronicity, serendipity, something with like the timing of stuff is very strange. Uh, because, yes, the day that I put up the, uh, the From Russia With Love uh, review, the Man From U.N.C.L.E. Uh, trailer went up that same day. Uh, and I was intrigued by the fact that the show started four days after the premiere of Goldfinger. So I was like, oh, well, I have to talk about this then. I have to talk about The, uh, the Man From U.N.C.L.E. Um, and likewise, uh, Christopher Lee, Sir Christopher Lee... Uh, died in the interim between From Rush With Love and uh, Goldfinger. And Goldfinger has a golden gun, so I was like, I, I need to, like, my heart needed to acknowledge it even briefly. So, you know, I said it, I, I intentionally set it up for a joke and then pulled away from the joke because I'm not, I'm not going to make fun of a dead man, you know, days after he has died. Um, I expect that there will be some sort of jokes in reference to his other work, uh, when the man with the golden gun comes around in a couple weeks, I want to say like three or four weeks, something like that. Uh, but by then, hopefully it will not be quite so too soon for like a Dracula joke or a Dooku joke or a, uh, a Saruman joke or something, you know? Uh, but I thought that'd be a nice kind of touch. Um, speaking of the man from uncle, I didn't get a chance to watch very much of it because the timing was so bad. Like I, <laughs> I didn't find out about this stuff until like the day I was writing the script and I needed to film that day and start working on it. Cause I was already kind of running late. Uh, so I got a chance to watch just the first episode. Uh, and even then only most of it, um, it actually seems really intriguing. Uh, it's, it's not a surprise to me just from watching one episode, why it was on the air for four seasons. Uh, but the more I read about it, things got weird in the fourth season. Like the direction started to go more comedy like in a quirky, you know, late 60s, early 70s, expectable sort of way, and people didn't react too favorably towards it, so uh, they they canned the show. Uh, I am going to watch more of The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Uh, whoops, the battery died. Uh-oh. Um, I, I have, I, I'm hoping that I get a chance to watch more of The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Uh, over the coming weeks. Um, it's going to depend how bad the schedule slip gets. I swear I'm trying to write these things shorter and they keep getting longer. It's weird with Goldfinger. I intentionally skipped a lot of jokes and I wound up with a 41 page, uh, sorry, not for Goldfinger for Thunderball. I skipped a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm trying to get the pacing up. I, I want to make sure that it's punchy. It's kind of hard to do in, in, you know, 36 minutes and, and, or sorry, 46 minutes for Goldfinger. So Goldfinger was 46 minutes for a review, and I want to say the script was about 38 pages long. Thunderball, where I'm, where I'm skipping out on stuff, the script wound up being 41 pages. So granted, there's there's a six-page introduction that you guys will understand more when it goes up. So I mean, technically speaking, if we're just talking about, um, if we're just talking, and, and The Man from U.N.C.L.E. I think only took about a, a, up about a page, a page and a half 
of Goldfinger. So if we're talking just the movie, then I guess they're about the same. But here's hoping. Uh, and yeah, the the they're 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 tricky. It's it's tough. I I had three weeks. I'm coming to the end of three weeks off from teaching. Uh, that I was hoping to use to get myself caught up, and then a lot of outside factors kind of made that not the case. So now I'm still catching up. I'm actually further behind than I was before. Uh, so if anything, that and me working the next two weeks are probably going to be uh, a pretty good incentive for me to make uh, a couple of those reviews a little bit shorter. Um, thankfully... Thunderball, so part of the reason Thunderball is going to be so long, too, is the movie is two hours and ten minutes long. <laughs> it's so long compared to the other one. The other ones are about, like, an hour 45, an hour 50. That extra 20, 25 minutes makes a pretty huge difference when it comes down to it. Uh, but I, I, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for you guys to see it. Uh, immediately after I'm done here, I'm going to be recording the voiceovers. Uh, we are planning on getting uh some slightly better microphones because this setup doesn't quite work unless i'm right on top of the microphone so uh my voice being super clear in the voiceovers but not so much when i'm on camera has been a bit of a problem so we're gonna be uh, uh there we go oh behind the scenes we're <laughs> We're, uh, we're probably going to try to get ourselves a new shotgun mic in the near future. Um, we got we got some stuff in mind. We're trying to make sure that the D-pad and Series Lee are as good as they can be. Uh, they're getting pricey, though. The next, like, seven Mega Man games we got to buy are, like, super expensive. So that's okay. The shotgun mic is a pretty huge priority just because I don't like giving you guys subpar audio. I'm, I'm a total perfectionist. There's... Part of the reason that these videos are taking me so long is because I'm being very meticulous with a lot of this stuff, and I want to make sure that it's as good as possible. Um, so the sooner we can fix this, uh, the better. But we'll, I, I, I digress. I'm getting way off track. I don't mean to complain. I don't mean to bitch and moan about our, uh, our audio setup. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else before, before I go. Um, Seriously, has been awesome so far. Uh, it is a challenge to uh, l allow myself to be inspired by other YouTubers and reviewers who I'm a fan of uh, without letting it uh, dictate some of the jokes. We're very, we're very quick to, to make referential jokes on the D-pad, uh, but, you know, it's a different medium and it's more in there as an homage. Very different in the review sense. A review is meant to be very personal and very self-oriented it's me telling you what i think of the movie and kind of walking you through my experience with it uh even if it's scripted it's still genuine it's still what i feel uh and i i don't want that to be tainted by other people's you know manners of of exploring that stuff um i watch a lot of john tron i watch, I watch a lot of nostalgia critic nostalgia chick i've been watching a lot of uh of Phalus recently um, I, I watch a lot of, a lot of other reviewers and stuff, and I just want to make sure that I'm not stepping on toes. Not like, not like I'm a big enough guy right now where that's going to be an issue or, or anything. I don't know if I ever will, but I, I certainly don't want to, uh, even, even do moderately well, let alone get big, but I don't want to, I don't want to do moderately well by stealing someone's bit. You know, uh, I, I think it's I think it's very important to be yourself and to be original uh, on YouTube. It's the greatest gift that technology has given us so far in the 21st century, aside from maybe the iPhone. Uh, and even then, that's mostly because the iPod was so was such an important thing. The point being, I want to be me on camera. I do not want to be a blob of John Tron and Doug Walker references exploding out at you guys if you want to watch john tron or nostalgia critic you can watch john tron or, or nostalgia critic uh i do when i want to watch their stuff so i don't i i don't want to insult you guys by mimicking someone else's style i want to i want to cultivate seriously into its own thing i want to cultivate rick into being a a a personality and, and a person that you guys can kind of connect with i guess i don't know 
I kind of like that. I like the idea of, of being able to talk with you guys and be candid like this. We haven't done a, uh, a State of the D video in a while just because things are moving so fast for us that it's really hard to keep track of what's coming. Um, Zelda's ending for us for a while, so that's cool. But uh, again, off track. This is not this is not state of the D. This is a seriously candid video. Uh, so that's all I got to say. Doctor No is good. From Russia with Love is great. Goldfinger is awesome. If I had to rank the three of them, Goldfinger from Russia with Love, Doctor No, hands down. Doctor No is not bad. It's very good, but the it, it's gotten better from one to the next. Um, and I know that Goldfinger is considered one of the best, like usually a top three contender in Bond. So I have to be prepared for not being as in love with the, the following ones as Goldfinger. So uh, I hope that you guys have enjoyed Seriously so far. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll put a little thing up here in the annotations so that you can click and, and see uh, the first three reviews if you haven't already. Spoilers, I guess, on having just spent, you know, the last basically hour uh, spoiling the shit out of all three reviews and even a little bit of Thunderball, but uh, there's some surprises left in, in that one, so I'm sure uh, I'm sure you guys will get a kick out of that. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm really hungry. I'm probably going to get a sandwich after this and then do audio. That's going to sound great. Fuck, I don't want it to end. I like this. We got 1,100 subscribers recently. That's pretty cool, and we're almost up to 300,000 views. That's pretty huge for for to me. I don't know if I don't know if it's huge in the long run, but it, I, I really appreciate it. And all of you guys who've been watching, I think we've got you know three to 400 views on all three of our uh, reviews so far. I appreciate that you guys have taken the time to watch those videos. It means a lot to me. Uh, I probably put 20 to 30 hours of work into each of those, which. Uh, has been honestly well worth it just for seeing how well these things have been received. Um, I love getting to edit. I love getting to put creative stuff together, and this is a really awesome outlet. So uh, thank you to all of you guys for watching, uh, and I'll see you guys again like this after On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Bye. Oh, shit. I totally forgot to talk about Casino Royale. I'll make it real quick. Uh... Here, I'll even I'll even sit in the chair. I pulled down the cam I pulled down the camera already because it's moving footage over. Uh, Casino Royale 1954 was it was actually kind of okay. I was expecting it to be pretty bad, and it was actually pretty good. Uh, slow, a lot of baccarat. Uh, it felt very 50s, but it wasn't bad. Okay, bye now for real. This is my